Hi everyone, it's November 5th and if you go ahead and click here for the lesson for today, you'll see where your homework is. Your homework is, is you need to take notes and study this excerpt about coffin ships. The coffin ships refer back to the famine period of the Irish where an estimated half million Irish were evicted from their cottages. Unscrupulous landlords used two methods to remove their penniless tenants. The first involving applying for a legal judgment against the head of the family for owing back rent. After the local banister pronounced judgment, the man would be thrown in jail and his wife and children dumped out on the streets. A notice to appear was usually enough for most of these poor families to flee and they were handed out by the hundreds. The second method was for the landlord to simply pay to send poor pauper families overseas to British North America. They were just getting rid of them. Landlords would first make phony promises of money, food, and clothing, and then pack the half-naked people in overcrowded British sailing ships, poorly built and often unseaworthy, that became known as coffin ships. The first coffin ships headed for Quebec, Canada. The 3,000-mile journey, depending on the winds and the captain's skill, could take from 40 days to 3 months. Upon arrival on the St. Lawrence River, the ships were supposed to be inspected for disease and sick passengers and they were removed to quarantine facilities on Gross Island, a small island 30 miles downstream from Quebec City. But in the spring of 1847, the year of the famine, shipload after shipload of fevered Irish quickly overwhelming the small medical inspection facility, which only had 150 beds. By June, 40 vessels containing 14,000 Irish immigrants waited in line extending two miles down the St. Lawrence River. It took five days to see a doctor, many of whom were already ill from the typhus-infected passengers. By the summer, the line of ships had grown several miles long. A 15-day quarantine was then imposed for all of the waiting ships. Many of the healthy Irish thus succumbed to the typhus as they were forced to remain in their life's infested holds. With so many dead on board the ships, hundreds of bodies were simply dumped overboard into the St. Lawrence River. It seemed that the English purposefully sent the poor Irish away, almost a sort of genocide, knowing that they would die. Others half alive were placed in small boats in the deposit on the beach at Gross Isle, left to crawl to the hospital on their hands and knees if they could manage. Thousands of Irish ill with typhus and dysentery eventually wound up in hastily constructed wooden fever sheds. These makeshift hospital, badly understaffed and unsanitary, became places to die with corpses piled like cordwood in nearby mass graves. Those who couldn't get to the hospital died along the roadsides. In one case, an orphaned Irish boy walking along the road with other boys sat down for a moment over a tree to rest and promptly died on the spot. The quarantine efforts were soon abandoned. The Irish were sent to the next destination without any medical inspection or treatment. From Gross Isle, the Irish were given free passage up the St. Lawrence to Montreal and cities like Kingston and Toronto. The crowded, open-aired river barges used to transport them. The fair skin iris to all day long summer sun causing many bad sunburns. At night they lay down close to each other to ward off the chilly air spreading more lice and fever. The pauper families have been told by their landlord once they arrived in Canada an agent would meet them and pay them out two and five pounds depending on the size of the family but no agents were ever found. They probably never existed. It was just a lie that the English told them. Promises of money, food, and clothing had been utterly false. Landlords knew that once the paupers arrived in Canada, there was virtually no way for them to ever return to Ireland to make a claim. Thus, they had promised them anything just to get them out of the country. Montreal received the biggest influx of Ir Irish at this time. Many of those arriving were quite ill from typhus and long-term malnutrition. Montreal's limited medical facilities at Point St. Charles were quickly overwhelmed. Homeless Irish wandered the countryside begging for help as temperatures dropped and the frosty Canadian winter set in but they were shunned everywhere by Canadians, afraid of contracting fever. Of the 100,000 Irish that sailed to British North America in 1847, an estimated one out of five died from disease and malnutrition, including over 5,000 at Gross Isle. Up to half of the men survived the journey, walked across the border to begin their new life in America. They had no desire to live under the Union Jack flag in sparsely paid populated British North America. They viewed the United States with its anti-British tradition and its bustling young cities as the true land of opportunity. Many left their families behind in Canada. Americans, unfortunately, not only had anti-British tradition dating back to the revolutionary, revolutionary era, but also had anti-Catholic tradition dating back to the Puritan era. America in the 1840s was by nation about 23 million inhabitants, mainly Protestant. Many of the Puritan descendants now viewed the growing influx of Romish Roman Catholic Irish with dismay. 